If you lived before our time, who would you be? What if you could choose from a thousand yesterdays when the past was today and the new took your breath away? Who would you be? How would you live? Who would you love? Living every generation before us, remembering for generations to come, the History Channel, where the past comes alive. In the 20th century's two world wars, submarines were instruments of terror. But in the long Cold War that followed, they became an indispensable part of high-stakes espionage. The full extent of underwater spying was largely unknown until a recent bestseller, Blind Man's Bluff, revealed the stories behind the perilous missions meant to gather intelligence. Our program is based on that book and the secrets it exposed for the first time. Join us now as the History Channel presents Blind Man's Bluff. They call them steel sharks. Mysterious, powerful, and deadly, submarines stalk the seas. They are among the most sophisticated killing machines ever created, and the most vulnerable. 8,000 ton ships designed to sink. 400 foot windowless tubes whose thin walls are all that separate the crew inside from the ocean's unforgiving depths. The men of America's subforce are all there by choice, Navy sailors willing to sacrifice sunlight to be part of an elite undersea brotherhood. A military corps so shrouded in secrecy, it's known as the Silent Service. Welcome to the Horse and Cow, where the Silent Service comes to make noise. For more than 30 years, America's submariners have been blowing off steam at this California bar. At the Horse and Cow, you could do anything you wanted to, and nobody would say nothing, as long as you didn't set the place on fire or something. It's 9 a.m. on an April Friday in 2000, and these sailors have converged on the cow to celebrate an anniversary the hundredth year of submarines in the Navy. For the first half of that history, subs were used mostly as weapons of war. John Periscope, fire! But in the wake of World War II, they became the tools of a trade as delicate as it was dangerous, spying. What? Submarines were able to gather through much of the Cold War did not lend itself to speculation or argument. It was cold, hard fact. If these operations had been compromised, if they had been discovered, the chances of them all being killed were very high. And so the missions and the people that led the missions were regarded as extraordinarily courageous. Submarines were the super secret front line of the Cold War, playing an undersea game of hide and seek whose stakes were nothing less than the fate of the world. I knew that at any moment I could receive an order to launch my missiles on the targets in the United States of America. The Russians have publicly said that they believe we maintain submarines off their coast near continuously from the mid-50s to the early 90s nearly 40 years, and I'll just say maybe the Russians aren't wrong, maybe they're right. There's no other force uh, in our entire defense establishment that uh, contributed as much as the submarine force to the collapse of the Soviet Union. For decades, these submariners could not talk about what they did, not to journalists, not to friends, not even to their own wives and children. But in 1998, the publication of the book Blind Man's Bluff brought their secrets to light. 
Now, as the Cold War sinks deeper into history, the extraordinary saga of American submarine espionage has finally begun to surface. August 1949. The American submarine Kachino slips out of its pier in Portsmouth, England, and into the North Atlantic. The 78-man crew think they're heading off to play war games with their sister sub, Tusk. But the presence of a stranger on board, a radio man named Harris Red Austin, hints that their mission is more than just an exercise. Austin, the crew will soon learn, is a spook, a Navy spy trained to intercept Soviet military transmissions. Our Navy had always been haunted by what happened at Pearl Harbor. And as we got into the Cold War and the nuclear age, our Navy was determined that it was never going to be taken by surprise again. We were afraid that the Soviets would figure out how to build an A-bomb and how to put them on missiles and launch them from submarines. And because of that, we took the USS Kachino and we sent her out to monitor the Soviet coast to see if they were indeed testing rudimentary missiles. Kachino is practically invisible as it sneaks to within 150 miles of the Russian naval base at Murmansk. This is one of the first submarine spy operations of the Cold War. And it's about to go horribly wrong. Thursday morning, August 25th, just off the northern tip of Norway. Kachino has been patrolling the area for four days allowing Red Austin to scan for Soviet signals. But he picks up nothing of value, and now Kachino has to rejoin its sister sub, Tusk, for training exercises. That's when the trouble begins. Charles Cushman was a junior officer on Kachino. I had just gotten off watch and had turned in and was awakened by a very loud explosion. One of the massive batteries that power the ship while it runs underwater has caught fire and set off a series of small blasts. With several men injured and toxic gases pouring into the hull, Captain Rafael Benitez has no choice but to surface the sub and order his crew to evacuate. They're greeted topside by 16-foot waves and 40-degree water. Cacino's cook, Joe Morgan, is one of the last men to reach the deck. Instantly, he's swept into the icy water. A wave broke over and just carried me off. In a short time, I lost sight of the ship completely. And I can remember my fervent prayer to the day that, that I didn't mind dying, but I didn't want to die here. Morgan is drifting in and out of consciousness when he's finally rescued. When they pulled me out of the drink, I was about, uh, about as cold as you can get and still be here. By this time, Kachino has alerted its sister ship, Tusk, by semaphore to the chaos on board. But Captain Benitez knows he needs a way of telling Tusk just how desperate the situation has become that his crew might need to abandon ship. Kachino's youngest officer, John Shelton, and a sonar expert named Robert Philo agree to be the messengers piloting a life raft through the churning waves. When the life raft got alongside of the tusk, another wave picked it up and put John Shelton on deck and crushed uh, Philo alongside the hull of the ship. Tusk crewman Norman Walker immediately jumps into the water to rescue Philo. I wrapped my legs around him. They finally got both of us aboard. That's when the big wave came over and took 12 of our guys over the side with the cables, stanchions, and everything. It just cleaned the whole deck off. Robert Philo and six of Tusk's crewmen die in the frigid Arctic waters. Back on Kachino, the crew has no idea of the tragedy that's taken place aboard their sister ship. They've been topside now for more than 12 hours. 
buffeted by the wind and the waves. Being as cold as it was and miserable as you were up there that uh, you uh, at times lost a desire to live. Kachino is going down, and the captain of Tusk, Robert Worthington, knows it. Left with a final dangerous option, he maneuvers his sub alongside its crippled counterpart. It was a miracle when these two ships come together, because with these torpedoes in both ships, you know, we're live. We broke out a folding gangway we had, and we gave them the end of it, and we held on the other end. When everything would get straight and level just for a minute, they dropped the gang board, and uh, as many as could would run across. The last man to reach Tusk, just before the plank slips off and shatters, is Cachino's captain, Rafael Benitez. And Benitez stands on the bridge, and he watches as Cachino just sinks below the waves. With 156 men crammed together inside, Tusk heads off to the nearest port. Well, the mood was very solemn uh, when we got aboard. The Tusk had lost six people, and plus the fact they had seven people they had rescued. Um, they were a tired crew. Both, both crews were tired. Tusk pulls into Hammerfest, Norway, where the wounded are dropped off and taken to a hospital. The others are given a choice. They can either be flown back to base in New London, Connecticut, or make the long trip home aboard Tusk. Every man chooses to stay with his comrades. By the time Tusk made it back to the States, the sinking of Kachino had become international news. The Soviets accused America of conducting suspicious training exercises near Murmansk. But even though Kachino's pioneering spy mission had ended in failure, the fears that inspired it proved well-founded. Just nine days after Kachino went down, American reconnaissance planes picked up evidence that the USSR had exploded its first atomic bomb. The world had entered a frightening new age. Its future hinged on who had the upper hand under the sea. By the mid-1950s, atomic anxiety was a fact of everyday life. First, you duck, and then you cover. And very tightly, you cover the back of your neck and your face. With the world split by a tense nuclear standoff, every detail was darkened by the shadow of Armageddon. There was a paranoia in America. We thought, you know, the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. What the public didn't know was that all the while, it was the U.S. whose submarines were secretly patrolling the enemy's shores. By now, the Navy had come to see the enormous potential of undersea espionage. If you want to learn the tactics of a, a foreign Navy, the best way to do it is to get as close to it as possible and observe them, listen to them. And a submarine's a perfect vehicle for that. These spy missions brought back vital intelligence on the strategy and technology of the Soviet fleet. They also brought the superpowers to the brink of confrontation as both sides wrestled for control of the world's most strategically valuable real estate, its oceans. July 29, 1957. The USS Gudgeon sets sail from Yokosuka, Japan. Its mission? To get as close as possible to the Russian Navy base at Vladivostok, an eavesdrop on the Soviet's Pacific Fleet. Only a select few of the 77 men on board know the details of this classified operation. But with several spooks along for the ride, Communications technician John Goldman can sense something big is brewing. So we knew we were going to be spying. 
but we didn't know that we were going to go inside Soviet waters as an enlisted man. Though Gudgeon was one of the Navy's newest boats, life on board any diesel-powered sub was hardly luxurious. For up to two months, nearly 80 men would crowd into a cramped steel tube packed with food and supplies. If we went on a long trip, for example, we loaded aboard a lot of canned goods and cases in passageways and walked on them. We literally ate our way down so we could stand up straight. Bunks were constantly damp. Showers were few and far between. And the air reeked of what submariners called eau de diesel. There are stories of men's wives just not, not letting him in the door until they stripped off their clothes because it was so foul. Life in a diesel sub was tough. These men were just another breed. There were some perks to serving on a diesel sub. Some mariners got the best food in the military, as well as their pick of Hollywood movies. It's 5 o'clock in the afternoon on August 19, 1957, and several of Gudgeon's off-duty crew members are enjoying one of these pictures. Throughout the day, Gudgeon has been hiding just off the Russian coast, recording the movements of the Soviet Navy and monitoring its communications. Gudgeon's mission is to learn everything it can about the enemy's fleet, the state of its technology, the sounds its ships make, and most urgently, if its submarines have been armed with ballistic missiles. Silent and nearly invisible, Gudgeon is the most advanced stealth weapon in the Navy's arsenal. But like all diesel subs, it still has one crucial vulnerability. Every 12 hours, it must surface to replenish its air and recharge its batteries. If it can't surface, the sub will run out of power and the crew will run out of oxygen. The idea is you'd stay there for 12 hours, you'd listen, you'd watch, then you'd tool out about 30 miles out to sea, then you'd make all the racket you had to as you vented your boat and recharged your batteries. Gudgeon is just about to head away from Russian waters when suddenly its alarms begin to sound, sending the crew scrambling to their battle stations. Soviet surface ships have spotted it, and now they're giving chase. Captain Norman Buzz Bazak immediately takes the sub deep, hoping to escape. But it's too late. The Soviets have Gudgeon hemmed in. But every time we would try to creep out a little bit, they would let us know by dropping a few hand grenades on us, and we'd have to stop. The men on board knew that at any moment, the Soviets could send out a full-size depth charge. They all knew that guys did not come home from World War II because of full-size depth charges. After several hours, Gudgeon's batteries begin running dangerously low. Lights are dimmed to save power. Crewmen are ordered to their bunks to conserve oxygen. The air grows thick with poisonous fumes. Some of the guys were starting to cough. Some were uh, actually feeling ill. It was cold. It was very, very quiet on the boat. And you could see the air. You could, you could taste it. With as many as eight Soviet ships prowling the waters above, the siege continues for 12 hours, then 24. Finally, after two full days, Captain Bazak has no choice but to give the order to surface. I heard them say, we got to get air into the boat. And as we got a periscope up, we found one of the Russian ships coming directly at us. With the collision alarm sounding, Gudgeon dives again before it can take in any more air. Still trapped, Bizak realizes he's out of moves. He gives the order to surface once more, but not before preparing his men for the worst. I heard the captain say, uh, we're going to go up. If they try to come aboard the boat, we're going to sink it. The spooks on board begin packing documents and film into weighted pouches to be ejected into the Sea of Japan. Their first command is to make sure no source of military secrets falls into Soviet hands, and that includes the spooks themselves. The intelligence guys had been given uh, what I understand was cyanide pills and told basically to, to take the pills if they were going to be captured. Those guys were pretty ashen-faced. They, they thought they were dead. 
As Gudgeon breaks the surface, her crew braces for a violent and possibly deadly confrontation. They're met instead by a brief, mocking message. The Soviets sent us a signal that said, thank you for the sonar exercises. We'll escort you out of the area. We were spying on them. They were spying on us. And I think everybody just said, let's leave it at that. That night, the men of Gudgeon celebrated their survival with a feast of steak and beer. But back in Washington, Navy brass were not impressed. Gudgeon had become an embarrassment, the first American submarine to be surfaced by the Soviets. It was an episode of Cold War brinksmanship that would stay secret for the next 30 years. They forced us to do what they wanted us to do. So it was absolutely a victory for them. In response, the commander of America's Atlantic fleet, Admiral Gerald Wright, offered an incentive for his men to even the score. A case of Jack Daniels whiskey to the first crew to surface a Soviet sub. Ted Davis was captain of the USS Grenadier at the time. So the word got out that this proclamation existed in a large frame outside of Admiral Wright's office. And immediately we said, well, this is a challenge. Davis and his crew got their shot at the prize in May 1959. Training off the coast of Iceland, they came across a Soviet diesel sub. Aided by an American spy plane, Grenadier chased its prey, trapping it beneath the waves for nine hours. And at 12.30 that night, the sonar hollered, he's surfacing, he's surfacing, he's surfacing. There he was on the surface, loud and clear. While the spy plane circled above, snapping surveillance photos like this one, the men of Grenadier claimed their reward. And we sent our message out and said, have surfaced Soviet submarine. Request Jack Daniels report aboard immediately. Their achievement was worth far more than a case of whiskey. As it turned out, they had surfaced a brand new Zulu-class sub, the first Soviet submarine converted to carry missiles. The Navy now knew the Soviets had matched their ability to launch a strike from the safety of the seas. It is everything we're afraid of. The Soviets have now shown us that they can actually engineer a Pearl Harbor in a nuclear age. The need to keep track of Russian missile subs raised the stakes of undersea espionage. But by now, it was clear that diesel boats were simply too vulnerable, too limited by their need to resurface to succeed at such risky work. The future of submarine spying belonged to the nukes. Nuclear-powered subs that were quieter, faster, and could stay submerged longer than anything that had come before. Yet as the Navy would soon discover, not even these were safe from the dangers of the deep. Barbara Lake is a widow of the Cold War. On February 15, 1968, she said goodbye to her husband Vernon as he set out from Norfolk, Virginia aboard the USS Scorpion. They left the day after Valentine's Day the only thing he was upset about was the fact that, that he was going to be gone for three months and he wouldn't be with me and, and wouldn't be with the baby. Scorpion was part of the Navy's growing arsenal of nuclear-powered submarines, the most advanced in the world. But its failure to return to Norfolk as scheduled would mark the beginning of a mystery that shadows the Navy and haunts Barbara Lake to this day. For years, I would wake up in the middle of the night, and I, I would think that I was smelling that musty smell of a submariner's clothes after they had been out to sea. And I would think, I'm talking to my husband, everything is okay. And I would wake up and realize life is different.
America's nuclear navy was born on January 21st, 1954, with the launch of the world's first atomic-powered submarine, the USS Nautilus. Its captain flashes a momentous message, underway on nuclear power. And as the Nautilus sails out to sea, history sails with her. Nautilus was the brainchild of a naval engineer named Hyman Rickover, a Polish-Jewish immigrant whose brilliance as a scientist was matched only by his genius as a bureaucrat. Nautilus's purpose was to prove nuclear power so the Navy Department and Admiral Rickover could get more nuclear submarines built. The strategy worked. Nuclear subs quickly became the mainstays of the American fleet. Unlike the diesels, which had to surface every 12 hours to take in air and recharge their batteries, the nukes were perfect for undersea spying. Their reactors supplied them with unlimited power, allowing them to stay silently submerged for months at a time. That completely changed the complexion of submarining. I mean, it was like going from uh, World War I SPAD fighter planes to the modern jet fighter. Life on board one of Rickover's boats was, by submarine standards at least, luxurious. Quarters were less cramped than on a diesel sub, and the nukes could manufacture their own fresh air and clean water. It's different than day and night. The nukes, you know, that's like living in a Waldorf story. Through the turbine. Hyman Rickover understood that Americans were suspicious of atomic power. Everything under this shield is radioactive. One nuclear accident could torpedo the whole program. Arrogant, hot-tempered, and ambitious, Rickover recognized that his own power depended on the safety of his subs. He was strictly a procedure man. If you did step five before you did step four in a procedure, and things didn't work out, you know, heads were gonna roll. By the late 50s, the Soviet Navy was building its own nuclear fleet. But it sacrificed safety in the rush to get more and more subs to sea. A series of horrific nuclear accidents resulted. Some of their submarines were so bad that when one had a nuclear accident, it was redubbed the Hiroshima and wasn't taken out of service until three accidents later. Nuclear accidents cost the Soviets at least 500 men over the course of the Cold War, a safety record former Soviet officials are only now beginning to acknowledge. The biggest number of nuclear accidents took place in the early days of nuclear technology. The Cold War tension was so high that occasionally we would have to go out to sea knowing that the submarines haven't finished their repair. But there was no choice. But if America's nuclear navy was far safer than Russia's, the dangers of submarining itself knew no national boundaries. On April 10, 1963, the nuclear sub USS Thresher went down during a test dive off Boston. The cause of the accident was a terrifyingly swift chain of events that started with a simple broken pipe and ended with the sub violently imploding, crushed by the pressure of the ocean depths. 129 men died aboard Thresher, the deadliest American submarine disaster of the Cold War. In response, Hyman Rickover vowed the U.S. would never lose another nuclear submarine. The Navy launched a far-reaching upgrade of its undersea safety standards, retrofitting subs with new ballast systems and super-strong welds. But the escalation of the war in Vietnam diverted resources from submarine maintenance. When the USS Scorpion left base in February 1968, it was one of four subs in the Atlantic fleet that had still not been overhauled. While her husband Vernon was at sea aboard Scorpion, Barbara Lake passed the time at home taking care of their one-year-old baby girl, Holly. Barbara was thrilled when the occasional letter would arrive. He was growing a mustache, he wrote, and exercising more. But his letters also said morale on board was low. The ship was suffering mechanical problems 
and marijuana use had become an issue. The crew was already anxious to get home when in mid-April, Scorpion was ordered into the North Atlantic to spy on suspicious Soviet activity near the Straits of Gibraltar. Russian surface ships had been launching mysterious balloons the Navy feared might contain electronic sensors. Scorpion's job was to find out exactly what the Soviets were doing. The submarine lurked in the area for several days, taking photographs, but learning little. On May 21st, 1968, Scorpion's crew radioed that they were finally heading home after nearly a hundred days at sea. At 1 p.m. on May 27th, Barbara Lake stood waiting with other families for Scorpion's scheduled arrival in Norfolk. My aunt had sent me money so I would have a new dress to wear to meet him at the dock. And we stood just looking out to sea, waiting to see the conning tower. And the hours went on and there was no conning tower. The Navy really didn't think the Scorpion was lost. I mean, it wasn't a joke they were playing on the families. They simply thought there was some communication issue. And as the day wore on and the rain fell and the Scorpion didn't arrive, they, uh, the Navy immediately knew something terrible had happened. A nuclear attack submarine, USS Scorpion, SSN 589, has been reported overdue at Norfolk, and units of the Atlantic Fleet have begun a search by submarines, circuit ships, and aircraft. But there was little hope. Scorpion's last radio contact had been a week before. This meant the sub had disappeared somewhere between the Azores, a chain of islands off Portugal, and Norfolk, a vast area of the mid-Atlantic. Even if Scorpion could be found, it was almost certainly trapped beneath the waves, too deep for its crew to be rescued. After 10 days, the Navy called off the search for survivors. On June 5th, the 99 men aboard Scorpion were declared legally dead. In Norfolk, Barbara Lake brought her daughter down to the ocean's edge to bid farewell to the father she would never know. I let our daughter put her hand in the water and I also touched the water and let it wash over my hand. And I said, if this, if this is the last part of you, then this, this is goodbye. And if you are still alive in there somewhere, then this is good luck, come home soon. The loss of Scorpion remains a mystery even today. In 1993, the Navy declassified this videotape of Scorpion's wreckage, which was found five months after its disappearance in 11,000 feet of water, 400 miles southwest of the Azores. As haunting as the images were, they offered no answers. In the shadow of uncertainty and the Navy's long silence, rumors and conspiracy theories have flourished. Barbara Lake believes the public has never been told the full story of Scorpion. What is so important to keep undercover for this many years, not to let all the families know what happened to their loved ones? What could be so important? One persistent whisper is that Scorpion was sunk by a Russian torpedo, a scenario the U.S. Navy has long rejected and former Soviet officials strenuously deny. No, of course it was not true. I can guarantee it was not true. Documents released in 1993 revealed for the first time the Navy's leading theory that Scorpion was sunk by one of the sub's own torpedoes. According to this theory, Scorpion's crew was forced to eject a torpedo that had activated. The torpedo then doubled back in the water and blew up the sub itself. But evidence uncovered recently by the authors of Blind Man's Bluff suggests a different scenario, that a torpedo may well have exploded while still on board, triggered by a single flawed piece of equipment. Turns out that the torpedo 
batteries uh, that make the torpedoes shoot through the water had been blowing up right and left in this testing lab in Keyport, Washington. And just before the Scorpion was lost, the lab had basically issued a recall notice. The authors believe this notice may have been intentionally suppressed in the wake of Scorpion's disappearance. It was never given to the people that were asked to figure out what had happened to Scorpion. In fact, we think maybe one or two people who saw it just deep-sixed it. John Craven, the Navy scientist who located Scorpion's wreckage in 1968, concedes that the Navy may have been aware of the flawed torpedo batteries. But, he argues, the urgent demands of the Cold War made it an acceptable risk to keep the sub at sea. She was out on a mission, and we didn't have any reason to believe that the batteries were going to fail while she was on that mission. Do you want to call up and break the mission down, which is important to national security, in order to come back for a possible flaw that probably isn't going to take place? There's a great quote, naval regulations are written in blood, meaning that when there is a problem or a disaster or a catastrophe, the Navy goes back and rewrites its rules and regulations to prevent that in the future. Since Scorpion, the U.S. Navy hasn't lost another nuclear submarine, even as it's undertaken some of the riskiest and most remarkable undersea spy missions ever conceived. For 11 years, from 1967 to 1978, Tommy Cox was a spook with a silent service. His job was to translate and interpret Soviet communications. But he also brought another skill on board. Look out on the wide Atlantic. I'd usually find a spot where they didn't mind if I played uh, uh, someplace where I wouldn't keep people away, and that was usually the torpedo room. And as the captain read the roll call. The songs were my expression of events aboard submarines that were significant to me. One of those submarines was the USS Lepon, skippered by a maverick captain named Whitey Mac. In 1969, Mack led Lepon and Tommy Cox on one of the most daring and dramatic underwater episodes of the Cold War, a remarkable seven-week chase that rewrote the rules of submarine spying. Well, the story is about Captain Mack and his nuclear-powered fast attack. SSN 661, a second boat to none. And after we've dogged down the hatch, the Lepon's a lady in black. By the late 1960s, the U.S. Navy had developed two types of nuclear submarine, each with its own mission. First, there were the ballistic missile subs, known as boomers, Every boomer carried 16 nuclear missiles. Each one contained greater explosive power than all the conventional bombs dropped by the U.S. in World War II combined. Boomers guaranteed America's ability to respond to a Soviet first strike. Their missiles could take out targets from as far away as 1,200 miles. Their crews trained for Armageddon. You'd get a radio message that tells you to go ahead and spin up your missiles and prepare to launch. That's when it really sunk in. Is this the real thing or not? And if this is the real thing, what's left of my home? The majority of the American subforce consisted of fast attack, or hunter-killer subs. The job of the fast attacks was to take out the Russian boomers before they could launch a first strike. The bottom line of the whole Cold War under the sea was to keep track of each other's missile submarines. The only way to keep track of where the Soviet missile subs were was to send out our submarines to try to find them. Russian fast attacks had the same mission. 
и подводные лодки Соединенных Штатов Америки. Our submarines had a task to find strategic American subs in the territory where they patrolled and to keep watching them as long as possible to be able to find whether they are going to start firing missiles or not. The Soviets had almost 400 submarines, three times as many as the US. Soviet subs dove deeper and went faster. But America's were far quieter a decisive advantage that allowed them to find and follow the Russians without being discovered. It would be like listening to a Cadillac go by and then listening to a Model T Ford. And they were literally that noisy. We were able to detect them at ranges that exceeded their ability to detect us. And we were thus able to maintain a trail at a comfortable distance without endangering our own ship. Yes, they did have this advantage. But our engineers and designers worked like hell to catch up. By 1969, the Soviets had almost done just that, launching a new, nearly silent class of missile submarine, ironically called the Yankee. Unless American subs could learn how to trail the Yankee, America's undersea advantage would disappear. For Navy brass, it was a nightmare. For Whitey Mack and the crew of Lepan, it was a challenge. Here was a brand new class of submarine, a Russian submarine, 24 missiles. We didn't know their operating area. We didn't know how, how they conducted their operations. We, we knew nothing about him. So it was important that we start learning real fast. September 1969, Whitey Mack leads Lepan out of its port at Norfolk. Among his hand-picked 119-man crew is a machinist named Donald Duck, a spook named Jesse James, and a dozen guitarists, including Tommy Cox. Mack himself is a larger-than-life character. At six foot six, 240 pounds, he has to stoop just to get around his sub. On September 16th, Mack learns that the Navy's underwater listening system, an ocean-wide sonar net known as SOSIS, has detected a Yankee heading into the Barents Sea. Lepon tries to follow the Soviet sub, finding and losing it several times over the next few days. And finally, we just projected where we thought he would go, and uh, fortunately, we hooked onto him. The Yankee is so quiet, Lepan can only hear it if it stays within 3,000 yards. One wrong move can lead to detection, perhaps even a collision. But Mack isn't about to turn away. He orders his men to stay with the Soviet sub, a tactic he calls the close-in trail. Simply put, Lepan is going to tailgate the Yankee. We had to stay fairly close because uh, the Yankee was pretty quiet. And he did this with a margin of safety by uh, depth separation. Yankee up here, and we were down here. For hours, then days, then weeks, over thousands of miles, Lepon tracks its prey. Whitey Mac stays in the control room the whole time, grabbing 15-minute catnaps, still standing on his feet. You got a, a ship that's over 8,000 tons and another ship that's over 4,800 tons operating within a mile of each other, uh, you want to be alert. It was really important that, that we would know exactly what he's doing all the time. Remarkably, all they have to go on is sound. People are always amazed when we tell them this, that the submarine is blind when it's submerged. This is not Captain Nemo's submarine with the glass viewing windows. The only sensor that allows you to know the environment around you is sonar. Over time, Lepon's sonar men master the Yankee's acoustic characteristics, the noises it makes as it goes through its daily routines. We could hear him when he was going up and down. Uh, it, the, the hull's creak, and we could hear that noise as the hull was creaking. We could tell when he's changing depth. They come to know the Yankee so completely they can tell which crewman is at the helm. They can even hear when one of the Soviets has gone to the bathroom. 
All the while, Lepon spooks are gathering information that will make the Yankee an easy mark for American fast attacks in the future. Every piece of data, from how the Yankee dumps its trash to the sounds its propellers make, helps paint a fuller picture of this new Soviet weapon. One of the primary uh, bits of intelligence was exactly where this ship was operating. We thought that it would be much closer to U.S. shore, but it wasn't. It's a frightening revelation. What it means is that the Yankees' nuclear missiles can strike a U.S. city from a distance of 1,300 miles, nearly twice as far as the Navy previously thought. Word of Lepon's secret chase soon reaches the White House, where President Richard Nixon is updated on its progress. But when someone leaks the story to the New York Times, it doesn't take long for the Yankee itself to get the news. He used to come to Periscope Depth every night at midnight, and he'd get his broadcast from Moscow. He came down after that one, and he went berserk for 24 hours. I mean, he, he just went all over. One of the Yankees' maneuvers is what American submariners call a crazy Ivan. When the Soviets think they're being trailed, they suddenly reverse course and head full speed back towards the enemy. The problem is, as they came roaring back, if there was somebody behind them, they risked a collision every time. So it was the ultimate game of chicken. Eventually, the Yankee resumes its routine, convinced it's not being followed. When its patrol is complete, it heads for home, and so does Lepon. Whitey Mack and his crew have found the Soviets' silent new sub and followed it for an astonishing 47 days. In the process, they've reasserted American superiority under the seas. As Lepon makes her way back to Norfolk, the Navy issues an order to every submarine in the Atlantic, get out of the way, Whitey's coming through. And Whitey's got the deck and the con. Nobody else can handle this big Amazon. And we won't be back till we finish our track. Yeah, Whitey's got the deck and the con. Yes, Whitey's got the deck and the con. Whitey Mac set the standard for what would become the main mission of America's fast attack fleet, to find and follow Soviet missile subs. It was a dangerous game for both sides. The slightest miscalculation could send a pair of submarines hurtling toward each other with no way to slam on the brakes. According to Admiral Valery Alexin, who investigated submarine accidents for the Soviet Navy, undersea collisions became an almost annual occurrence during the Cold War. Between 1967 and 1993, there were altogether 20 collisions between Russian and American submarines. Every collision was a potential nuclear catastrophe. Any of them could have ignited a superpower confrontation. One of the worst occurred in 1970 in the North Pacific, when a 6,000-ton Soviet sub slammed down on the USS Tautog. Mike Mays was a sonar technician on Tautog. I'm telling the chief, you know, I said, well, we're awful close. And he says, take your headset off. And I said, what do you mean? Take your headset off. Pull the headset off. You could hear him through the hall. I said, we are awful close. <laughs> and shortly thereafter is when it impacted. Tautog survived, but as it left the scene, its crew thought they heard the sickening sound of the Russian sub ripping apart. It wasn't until 30 years later and the publication of Blind Man's Bluff that they learned the truth. The Soviets had survived as well. Other Russian subs were not as fortunate. Over the course of the Cold War, the Soviets would lose four submarines, though none due to a collision. Ironically, the search for one of them would spawn some of the greatest triumphs of American undersea espionage and one of its most embarrassing failures. It was a massive ship for a fantastic scheme. Glomar Explorer, 
built by eccentric billionaire Howard Hughes to mine minerals from the ocean floor. Or at least, that's what the public was told. The true purpose of Glomar Explorer was even more far-fetched. A CIA plot to steal a Russian submarine from the bottom of the sea. One of the most expensive covert operations of the Cold War would wind up a very public fiasco. But it wasn't until the publication of Blind Man's Bluff in 1998 that the events leading up to it became known. The secret story of Halibut, the Navy's first specially equipped spy sub. Halibut was hardly one of the Navy's proudest submarines. The uh, ship was old, it's slow, it's noisy, it's ugly. You wouldn't have want to been got into any trouble on Halibut because you didn't have the speed or the stealth to get away. Designed to fire missiles from the surface, Halibut had a 22-foot wide hatch that opened into its bizarre humpbacked hull. It was this unusual feature that inspired John Craven to save it from the scrapyard in 1964. The 30-year-old Craven was a scientist involved in naval intelligence. His job was to dream up new ways of doing undersea espionage. The first program that we started out with, I can now say, was a program in general to recover hardware of significance from any place on the ocean seafloor without being detected in the process of recovering that hardware. As soon as he saw Halibut, Craven realized it was perfect for the job. Its large missile hatch would allow men and equipment to enter and exit the sub while the sub was still underwater. Over the next few years, the Bat Cave, as the crew called it, would be refitted with $70 million worth of cutting-edge spy gear, including a pair of remote-operated deep-sea submersibles nicknamed fish. These fish were not little like denizens of the sea swimming around. They had strobe lights for eyes, sonar whiskers, cameras. They were going to be designed to dangle as far as three miles down and scan the ocean bottom. Funding for all this new equipment was secretly transferred from other Navy programs. Not even Congress knew the details of Craven's special project. But it would soon prove worth every penny. In April 1968, a Soviet ballistic missile submarine disappeared in the Pacific. The sub was known as K-129, and American sonar data indicated the Soviets were searching for it in the wrong place. Captain James Bradley, the man in charge of the Navy's super-secret undersea spy program, realized that if the U.S. could find it first, it would be sitting on an intelligence gold mine. But how could the Navy locate a lost Soviet submarine without the Soviets knowing they were looking for it? The answer, Bradley hoped, was halibut. That summer, halibut was ordered into the North Pacific to find and photograph K-129. For the first time in history, an undersea search would be launched from beneath the waves without the need for a surface ship. This was one of the most secretive things that our government ever did during the Cold War. The crew didn't even know what the mission was. So I think uh, that tells you that we considered it pretty secret. Heck, it was top secret. With Craven's fish dangling three miles below, Halibut began trolling for signs of the Soviet sub. Spent a lot of long days and nights up there, back and forth and back and forth. Finally, one day, this one crew member comes running uh, into the captain, and he says, Captain, Captain, you wouldn't believe what we found. Halibut's fish had found K-129. Over the next several days, it would take more than 20,000 pictures of the Soviet sub, all of which remain classified to this day. When Halibut returned to base at Pearl Harbor, Naval intelligence officers were waiting at the dock to take the photographs back to Washington. Well, the pictures went almost immediately to the National Security Agency for their evaluation. And in no time flat, Mr. Kissinger and the Nixon administration have an opportunity to look at them. All of a sudden, it became a finding of great significance. 
Up to now, the business of undersea espionage had mostly been left to defense intelligence. But when the CIA director, Richard Helms, saw these photographs, and more importantly saw how interested President Nixon was, they immediately jumped in and started to try to muscle the Navy out to take control of this effort. And they say, well, we could outdo Halibut. She got 20,000 pictures. We'll get the whole submarine. Navy scientist John Craven thought the CIA's idea was crazy. Even if they could somehow lift the sub off the seafloor, it would almost surely disintegrate in the process. But the CIA won out. With the approval of President Nixon and the cover provided by his friend Howard Hughes, Glomar Explorer was born. The ship took two years to build and cost hundreds of millions of dollars. It was as long as two football fields and weighed 50,000 tons. Yet the mission of Glomar Explorer remained hidden in plain sight to lift K-129 from the bottom of the ocean. It was a dangerously provocative act. The CIA was trying to steal the tomb of 100 Soviet submariners. If Moscow learned the truth, the fallout could push the superpowers to the brink of World War III. Well, it was both risky and expensive. Uh, it was an enormous operation, uh, and the amazing thing is how secret it was kept. This was not only secret, it was top secret. Then on top of that, it was code word. And then on top of that, you had to prove a need to know. In the summer of 1974, Glomar Explorer headed out to the spot where Halibut had found K-129, 1,700 miles northwest of Hawaii. Soviet spy boats dismissed the unusual vessel as an oil exploration rig. No one expected that they could try to raise the K-129 because at the time it was considered impossible to raise a submarine from such a depth. What the Soviets didn't know was that hidden within Glomar's vast, empty interior was an enormous steel claw which could descend more than three miles. In early July, Glomar's crew slowly began lowering the claw, which they nicknamed Clementine. Twice, it jammed into the ocean floor, 17,000 feet below the surface. On the third try, Clementine's steel fingers wrapped around the 5,000-ton sub. Slowly, the claw raised its prey, six feet every minute. After 14 hours, it was still two miles from the surface. Then, suddenly, Clementine began to buckle under the stress. The sub dangled briefly before tearing in two. The bulk of K-129 fell back to the ocean floor, this time forever. In the end, Glomar Explorer would only recover about 10% of the submarine, along with the remains of six Soviet sailors. To Almighty God, we commend the souls of these departed Soviet sailors. Glomar's crew conducted a solemn Russian funeral, which they filmed in case the USSR ever found out about their mission. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. The CIA hoped to send Glomar Explorer out for a second try the following summer. But before that could happen, the press discovered that Howard Hughes' colossal ship was not what it seemed. In February 1975, the secret purpose of Glomar Explorer suddenly became front page news. The response from the Kremlin was surprising. The Soviet government made a statement that all our boats were at their home ports and that the Soviet Union didn't lose one of their boats. Instead of reacting with outrage, Moscow refused to even acknowledge that one of its subs had gone down. The reason? The Soviet government had never told its own people about the sinking of K-129. Soon after the story of Glomar Explorer broke, Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev began sending the White House back-channel messages that said, in effect, if you let this drop, so will we. It was a deal President Gerald Ford was happy to accept. 
But in post-Watergate Washington, a skeptical Congress was not about to ignore a CIA plot to steal a Soviet sub. In March 1975, the House Select Committee on Intelligence opened hearings on Glomar Explorer. That was one of the bigger boondoggles I've ever seen. That was half a billion dollars to get some tiny pieces of an obsolete Russian submarine, which they brought into the committee room as if they were carrying chunks of the Holy Grail. The trail from Glomar Explorer eventually led Pike's committee to the Navy's undersea espionage program. Pike quickly discovered that the risks submariners were taking were far more dangerous than anything he could have imagined. From the aggressive trailing that had already led to several collisions with Russian subs, to the falsifying of patrol reports to keep these activities from being discovered. They were rewarded for taking risks. Well, it's all right if you're taking risks for yourself, but they were taking risks involving the United States of America. But in the end, Pike's committee decided to go easy on the Navy. The reason? The most secret and successful submarine spy operation of the Cold War. A wiretapping job that was a long way from Watergate. August 1979. The American spy sub Parchi passes beneath the Golden Gate Bridge and heads into the Pacific. Only a few of the 140 men on board even know where they're going, but they all know what will happen if they get caught. They were carrying self-destruct charges. They were told that if they were discovered, they weren't coming home. Several months later, and 5,000 miles from San Francisco, it's business as usual off the port of Murmansk on the Barents Sea. Fishing trawlers dot the harbor while the ships of Russia's northern fleet move in and out of base. They have no idea that just 500 feet below them, divers from the USS Parchi are carrying out the most daring and dangerous undersea espionage operation of the Cold War, tapping the phone cables of the Soviet Navy. It's one in a series of missions so secret that to this day, Navy officials refuse to acknowledge its existence. I can not confirm or deny any specific activity, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, intelligence was obtained that gave us a very, very accurate, clear and unambiguous continuing insight into their military planning. It was late 1970, and the Navy's top undersea spy, Captain James Bradley, was trying to solve a puzzle. He'd been studying a map of the Sea of Okhotsk on Russia's Pacific coast. On one side was the Soviet Navy's submarine base at Petropavlovsk. On the other was its Pacific headquarters at Vladivostok. Bradley believed the two had to be linked by phone lines that stretched across the bottom of the sea. And the idea was that if we could sneak in there with submarines and divers and get the messages passing through those cables, that we could really learn their mo innermost secrets. But even if Bradley's hunch were correct, even if Soviet lines were lying on the ocean floor, the puzzle remained. How do you find a five-inch cable in the middle of a 600,000-square-mile sea? Sitting in his Pentagon office, Bradley began thinking back to the summers he spent as a child on the Mississippi River. Suddenly, he remembered the warning signs he used to see along the bank. Cable crossing, do not anchor. Now those signs are there to keep some idiot in a pleasure boat from snagging a phone or utility cable in the shallows. And Bradley look, looks up, his eyes snap open, and he realizes, if we had those idiots, the Soviets did too. With the approval of President Nixon, Bradley ordered the Navy's top spy sub, Halibut, to head for the Sea of Okhotsk. Its mission bordered on the surreal, to find a sign that might not exist, marking a cable that might not exist. And that would be the easy part. The hard part would only begin if Halibut actually located the cable. 
Hidden inside a compartment perched on the sub's hull was a decompression chamber like this one. While the sub descended, divers would wait inside the chamber, acclimating themselves to the increased pressure of the ocean depths. That system gave us capability of putting men out on the seafloor at depths at least to 600 feet and maybe, maybe even deeper. And once you get that capability, you now have the capability of men doing jobs uh, on, on the, on the seafloor. And one of those jobs, obviously, is tapping a Soviet cable. Halibut reached the Sea of Okhotsk in November 1971. It took less than two weeks of scanning the Soviet coast to prove that James Bradley's hunch had been right on the money. There, sticking out of the desolate shoreline, was a sign in Russian that read, do not anchor, cable here. The cable Bradley had long imagined was running right along the ocean floor. With the sub sitting just above the seabed, Halibut's divers climbed out of their decompression chamber and into the icy deep. Unique individuals, no fear. You wouldn't get me out of a submarine in 400 feet of water in the middle of the ocean. No way. The divers gingerly moved a small, specially constructed tap into position on top of the Soviet cable. The tap worked by magnetic induction, which meant the divers didn't have to risk breaking into the line to record the signals running through it. A temporary wire linking the tap to the sub allowed the spooks on board to listen in. And up through the wire into Halibut comes pure military gold. I mean, they're hearing the Soviets' own assessments of success and failure. For the first time, the United States had found a way to penetrate a hardwired phone line and record Soviet military communications as they happened. When Halibut returned to California a month later, National Security Administration officials whisked the tapes away from the sub even before the crew could disembark. They just had a short recording time but they managed to get enough to show that it could be done. Halibut was soon heading back to the Sea of Okhotsk, this time to install a much larger tap. The crew called it the Beast. It was 20 feet long, weighed six tons, and took four divers to maneuver into position. Once the tap was in place, it could be left to record weeks of Soviet transmissions. We could learn where they were sending their missile subs, what kind of shape their missile subs were in, which ones were having problems. We could get right inside their thinking, right inside their minds. Over time, Halibut would be joined by two other spy subs, Seawolf and Parchi. In 1979, Parchi successfully completed the riskiest of their missions, tapping the line running under Russia's northern fleet in the Barents Sea. It's all the while that they were out there working you could hear Soviet warships passing overhead. Bob Ellenwood was a spook on this and four other cable tapping missions. Until now, no crew member has ever acknowledged on camera the existence of these operations, which went by the code name Ivy Bells. That was a list of specific targets that, uh, in various locations that we were to go attempt to, to tap, and we did. Ellenwood recalls eavesdropping on Soviet conversations, many of which were unencoded. As with anybody on telephone communication, they have a tendency to be a lot more open, especially if they think of it as a secure line. Sometimes it was good, sometimes it wasn't worth listening to, other times it was funny. They even get to hear Yet one young man trying to practice wooing his girlfriend in English. Suddenly, they're hearing who the adversary is. They're meeting the enemy ear to ear with one side deaf to the transaction. By the late 1970s, they were leaving taps large enough to record up to a year of Soviet communications at a time. Divers from another sub would then return to collect and replace the top secret tapes. Sometimes they'd come back with dinner, giant crabs plucked from the sea floor. On one occasion, they also left behind a gift for the next crew. The divers on one sub actually buried a cow skull right down with the tap pod so they could scare the next group of divers that came over. 
But if cable tapping became more frequent, it never became routine. Ivy Bells remained the most dangerous submarine espionage operation of the Cold War. Every cable tapping mission required the personal approval of the president. The men involved knew full well the stakes of what they were doing and the consequences if they were caught. I expect the ship would have been scuttled and self-destruct charges would have been used to destroy the vessel. Sometimes they question, you know, should we be doing this? Should we be sneaking into a Soviet sea? Are we going to create the war that we're trying to prevent? But in the end, the intelligence that was coming through was so crucial, we almost had no choice but to keep going. The tapping of Soviet cables continued for more than a decade. But in the early 1980s, this man would give it all away. The secret of Ivy Bells would be sold to the Soviet Union for $35,000. Throughout the 1970s and into the 80s, American subs continued to successfully tap Soviet undersea phone cables. Then, during a mission in 1981, a storm in the Sea of Okhotsk slammed the USS Seawolf down on top of the Soviet cable. Seawolf survived, but Navy officials feared the impact might have briefly broken the line, compromising one of the most secret submarine spy operations of the Cold War. Indeed, soon afterwards, Soviet ships not only found the cable tap, they lifted it right out of the ocean and brought it ashore. This photograph, the only image of a cable tap publicly available, was taken by the Russian military. They didn't have to look hard to figure out who had planted the device. All transistors and other parts were stamped made in the USA. It just shouted, property of the United States government. It was the first year of Ronald Reagan's presidency, and the Cold War was heating up. Now, the Soviets had caught America red-handed, running spy operations in what the Kremlin considered territorial waters. But the Soviets stayed quiet about their explosive find. As it turned out, they had a secret to protect as well. It wasn't Seawolf that had blown the cable tap's cover. It was a spy, one of two Americans whose treachery nearly cost their country its advantage under the sea. I regard these as two of the most treasonable acts in the history of the United States of America. The fact that we were able to continue at all is only due to the skill and the bravery and the intrepid action on the part uh, of our submariners. In January 1980, the Soviet Embassy in Washington received the following phone call. I have something I would like to discuss with you. I think it would be very interesting to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is there any way to do so in, in, in uh, confidence or in privacy? The caller turned out to be Ronald Pelton, a 38-year-old former employee of the National Security Agency, a shadowy clearinghouse for America's most sensitive communications intelligence. Pelton simply made himself available to be interrogated and spoke. The problem is that Mr. Pelton's one of those rare individuals with a near photographic memory. Over the next five years, Pelton would spill some of the NSA's most vital secrets in return for just $35,000. One of those secrets was the existence of the American cable tap in the Sea of Okhotsk. I gave up five years of my life for that mission probably a marriage. I put a lot of hard work into it. I mean, you know, you just don't watch something like that go away when you've worked so hard at it just because some turkey needed a little extra cash. Pelton was arrested in November 1985, hard on the heels of another shocking discovery. The existence of a spy ring so devastating, it could well have given the Soviets a decisive edge in a nuclear showdown. This man, Alexander Sokolov, is a former KGB agent. He has never before been interviewed about his role in handling the longest running and most lucrative spy ring of the Cold War. In 1967, Sokolov was officially a diplomat working in Washington, but he was really a spy. 
He received a visit that October from an American submariner and communications expert named John Walker, Jr. When he walked into the embassy, he looked substandard. A cheap suit, a shoddy coat. He needed money. He offered bluntly to pass some information for money. Walker met with the Soviets again a month later. This time, he was bearing top secret treasure, a list of codes that allowed the Soviets to unscramble messages sent from US Navy headquarters to the Atlantic fleet. He himself knew very little. But what he did was hand the Russians the keys to our communications. He gave them the ability to decrypt something like a million um, Navy operational messages. And that was just the beginning. Stationed at the naval base in Norfolk, Virginia, Walker had access to a steady stream of technical manuals, classified reports, and other top secret information, which he continued to pass along to the Soviets. After retiring from the Navy in 1976, Walker recruited others to keep the flow of secrets coming. His best friend, a Navy communication specialist named Jerry Whitworth, his brother Arthur, who worked for a defense contractor, even his own son Michael, an enlisted man on the aircraft carrier USS Nimitz. These secrets reshaped Soviet naval planning in the Atlantic. Walker's information did affect the decisions that were made by the Soviet government. It was so valuable that the Soviet military sometimes was amazed that they were receiving it. Through the Walker spy ring, the Soviets learned what the U.S. had known for years, that their submarines were too noisy, too easily trailed. In response, they pulled their fleet closer to home and began hiding their missile subs in the icy maze of the Arctic, where they would be almost impossible to track. It was a strategic shift that sent shockwaves through the Pentagon. The closest point between the US and the Soviet Union was really up over the North Pole. If you could hide your subs there, you could launch before anybody could ever get you. By the late 70s, a small group of Navy analysts, among them Richard Haber, began to suspect that the Soviets knew more than they should. But their concerns were brushed aside. No admiral wanted to believe there could be a spy. I guess one of the failures of my life was not to be able to tell that story effectively enough, believably enough, with enough detail to prompt the sort of counterintelligence investigation that was necessary to find John Walker. It wasn't until May 1985 after Barbara Walker turned her husband in to the FBI that the Walker spy ring was finally broken. By then, John Walker Jr. had been passing secrets to the Soviets for an incredible 18 years. For just over a million dollars, he had nearly destroyed America's undersea advantage. I can say that uh, he was uh, like a gold car for Soviet intelligence. Walker was a catastrophe. He was a disaster. John Walker may be the single most damaging traitor uh, in recent American history. In October 1985, Walker pleaded guilty to espionage charges and was sentenced to life in prison. The betrayal of the man they called Johnny Walker Red was especially bitter to his fellow submariners. We were angered by the fact that one of our own, through pure greed, uh, sold the keys to the kingdom and put our ships and our sailors in harm's way. Together, John Walker Jr. and Ronald Pelton left America's subforce dangerously exposed during some of the darkest days of the Cold War. But there were still plenty of secrets they didn't have access to. While Pelton had given up the cable tap in the Sea of Okhotsk, his clearance was limited. Neither he nor the Soviets had any idea that the USS Parchi had placed a similar tap on phone lines stretched across the Barents Sea. In November 1983, this tap captured intelligence so valuable, one Navy official called it the crown jewels. 
At the time, NATO was conducting one of the most provocative military exercises of the Cold War. Codenamed Able Archer, it was designed to simulate the start of a nuclear conflict in Europe. The Soviets, already convinced that the U.S. was planning a first strike, briefly went on nuclear alert. The whole time, the tapes in the cable tap were rolling, recording the movements of Russia's northern fleet. What the tapes revealed was that American intelligence had been dead wrong about where and how the Soviets planned to disperse their forces in time of war. The Soviets' top priority, it turned out, was to protect their own missile subs. They weren't preparing to launch a first strike from the sea after all. I think that the intelligence we got out of some of these uh, intercepts calmed us down some. They weren't trying to take over the world. They were trying to protect their own bloody country. We were a much bigger threat to them from their point of view than they were to us. It was reassuring news, and it helped pave the way for the superpowers to pull back from the edge of Armageddon. Yet all during the thaw that followed, it was still business as usual beneath the waves. In late 1986, the USS Parchi was on a cable tapping mission in the Barents Sea when a hastily arranged summit between President Ronald Reagan and Soviet Premier Mikhail Gorbachev was convened in Reykjavik, Iceland. Word came to Parchi, stop, do not penetrate Soviet territorial waters. And in fact, she was waiting just outside Soviet waters the entire time Reagan and Gorbachev were up talking the minute Reagan steps foot on Air Force One. Parchi gets the word, go ahead, go in, finish your mission. During a 1988 meeting at the Pentagon, the chief commander of the Soviet armed forces, Marshal Sergei Aromeyev, acknowledged that America still held the edge in the Cold War under the sea. He turned to me and says, you, he said, you and your submarines, you're the problem, quite, quite vehemently. So it was clear that he was frustrated by the fact he could not keep track of our submarines. He knew they were there. He knew we kept track of their submarines, and he couldn't counter that. Still, there was no way to foresee the extraordinary changes just around the corner. Well, I'd, I'd love to be able to say that we all in the Reagan administration saw the end coming, but uh, I, for one, did not. When I left the government, I left in the confident prediction that the Cold War would be around for a long, long time. Instead, with stunning swiftness, the superpower standoff that had divided the world for so long simply evaporated. In 1989, the Berlin Wall fell, and along with it, the Iron Curtain. Two years later, on Christmas Day, 1991, the Soviet Union ceased to exist. After four decades, the West had won the Cold War. And by then, it was clear that the U.S. had prevailed in the battle beneath the waves. Less than a year after the disintegration of the Soviet Union, in October 1992, a CIA director visited the Kremlin for the first time. Robert Gates knew his historic mission demanded a dramatic gesture. Somebody had mentioned to me that there was a videotape that had been made on the Glomar Explorer when the uh, Soviet Golf-class submarine was raised of the funeral services uh, for the Soviet sailors who, whose remains were found. To Almighty God, we commend the... The film had been shot in 1974 during one of the most audacious espionage operations of the Cold War. And the sure and certain... Now, Robert Gates presented it to Russian President Boris Yeltsin as a symbol of reconciliation. And when I, when I gave it to him and described it and he watched it, uh, tears came into his eyes. It illustrated that, you know, this, this is, it's over. Uh, the Cold War is over and, and let's move on to the future. A decade later, the Cold War seems a distant memory, but the steel sharks of the US Navy are as active as ever. At its peak in the 1980s, America's submarine force numbered 139 ships. Many of these have since been decommissioned. The fleet is now down to 74, 18 boomers, and 56 fast attacks. It's a much smaller force, but also more versatile. 
Submarines in the post-Cold War era are reinventing themselves. They've gone from warships to spy ships to a combination of the two. It's August of 2000, and the 134-man crew of the USS Montpelier is on a training run off Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Man battle stations. Man battle stations. Right, keep a watch. Man battle stations. Today, they're simulating one of the most important missions of the Fast Attack's new hybrid role, the stealth missile salvos known as strike warfare. Our ship carries uh, 12 vertical launch Tomahawk missiles, and uh, we also carry Tomahawks in our torpedo room so we can execute a 16 missile salvo if called upon. Should we decide to exert that option, uh, we can move in position covertly. We can be there before the president uh, has uh, shown his cards. If he wants to launch a strike that's a complete surprise from close in, the submarine force is the uh, uh, platform of choice. Commence launch. All stations, commence launch. New technology continues to transform America's undersea arsenal. Soon, even the periscope will become a thing of the past, replaced by a digital optical mast that provides a video picture clearer than what the human eye can see through today's periscopes. But with hotspots popping up all over the globe, the main mission of America's fast attack fleet remains what is known as ISR, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. It's a common misconception that uh, now that the Cold War has ended, uh, we're out of that business, uh, when frankly we're doing more of that than we ever have before. American subs are currently stalking the seas off Asia, monitoring the waters of the Middle East, and patrolling drug smuggling routes in the Atlantic and Caribbean. And as long as Russia maintains one of the largest navies in the world, as long as the bear still swims, U.S. officials like to say, American submarines will continue to keep an eye on Russia's fleet. On August 12, 2000, two American subs were lurking nearby as Russian forces took part in extensive naval exercises in the Barents Sea. At around 8 a.m., American sonar reportedly picked up a pair of explosions, the death throes, it turned out, of the Russian nuclear sub Kursk. 118 men died aboard Kursk, a tragedy that riveted world attention on the plight of the once mighty Soviet Navy. Outside of Murmansk, Russian nuclear submarines sit mostly idle. There is little money from Moscow for training or maintenance. A potential environmental catastrophe looms. There are a lot of spent reactors rotting in the Barents Sea. There's an enormously expensive cleanup that is going to have to happen. For 40 years, American submariners shadowed their Soviet counterparts. What they did could have started World War III. What they learned helped prevent it. No military force in the Cold War knew the enemy so intimately or shared such kinship with the men they were trained to destroy. Remember, in a world where you can't tell your wives or your children or your parents what you're doing, the people you have the most in common with are the people on the other side. I've never talked to an American submariner who didn't respect his Soviet or Russian counterpart. He knew they both shared the same experience of taking a ship to sea in a big, ugly ocean where it could crush him like, a, like an eggshell any time it wanted to if he made a mistake. Here at the International Submariners Convention held in St. Petersburg, Russia, in June of 2000, one-time foes swap stories like longtime friends. I just want to say that <laughs> if there's any possibility of uh, ex-warriors <laughs> Patching things up, it would be submariners, I think. I really believe that. For organizer Igor Curtin, the convention is a way of getting past the propaganda of the Cold War years. There was never any hostility towards American submariners. We can better, perhaps, call it rivalry. At the Naval Cathedral in St. Petersburg, the Church of St. Nicholas, the submariners gather for a special service paying tribute to their fallen comrades. Memorials commemorate Soviet and American submariners who died during the Cold War. 
It's a solemn testament to the brotherhood the silent service breeds. These men share different sides of a story that is only now starting to be told. The 1998 publication of Blind Man's Bluff has begun to bring this remarkable history to light. But those in the know say there is still much to be revealed. I do believe that uh, the whole story is significantly more revealing than uh, what's been uh, put out there thus far. I think when the public sees it all, they'll realize they were extraordinarily well served for 40 years. The rest of the story remains classified for now. In the meantime, Blind Man's Bluff has become a surrogate way for many submariners to share their secrets, the extraordinary experiences they've kept hidden from their wives, their children, their best friends for so many years. Man after man comes up to us to say thank you. Thank you so much. And it's not even that they were looking for outside credit. It's just the relief of finally being able to discuss what was for many of them the very best moments and the very worst moments of their lives. Now I just say, why don't you just read that book, Blind Man's Bluff. I know quite a few other submariners that have bought a lot of copies and without comment just said it to relatives and said, read it. And this will explain a lot. Our middle daughter, when she read it, called and said, you know, Mom, if I didn't love and admire my dad as much as I do after I read this, I really would admire my dad. It's been a catharsis for many of us, and it's brought our family together. During that period of time, I did the most important thing that I'll ever do in my life for the most people. And then to be able to contribute to something that was so important to our nation, it's a real honor. The Navy's official reaction to the book Blind Man's Bluff was a simple no comment. Many individual sailors are also reluctant to talk about their Cold War missions. Many signed documents swearing them to secrecy for 80 years, effectively a lifetime ban since they were already in their 20s. But unofficially, nearly everyone involved in underwater espionage, from former enlisted men to top Navy brass, seem grateful that their heroics are now out in the open. For the History Channel, I'm Roger Mudd. Thanks for watching. There's a story about a friend of mine Who made a patrol with us one time We can't mention his name hardly We'll just call him Tango Charlie And nobody cared to ask him why It's rumored he was a master spy Now the captain didn't brief the crew Hell, we were out at sea a day or two He didn't tell us too much then He just handed us a pen And made us sign on the dotted line So we wouldn't talk about old master mine Now tell me if you have ever seen A secret kept in a submarine 